Hey folks, it's your friends at SCTV9, and we're here yet again this August to continue celebrating Historic Situate. Today, we have a phenomenal tour for you. Can you guess where we are, folks? Well, you're gonna have to wait 10 seconds to find out. Welcome to the Maritime and Irish Mossing Museum. It's located at 301 Driftway in Situate. This building opened up in 1997. Uh, it's a very old building. It was constructed as a home in 1739. And actually, the part of the building that we're standing in right now may have been built even earlier than that, possibly the late 1600s, and was moved here. So it's a very old building. Um, and we have a lot of exhibits in here. Most everything in here relates to Citroën maritime history. Um, we do also cover uh, some of the maritime history from Hull down to Plymouth, but for the most part it focuses on Citroën maritime history. So this is a very old building and in the 1770s the building actually was used by, by the town of Citroën as a smallpox hospital and uh, the smallpox epidemic was, was severe here, like it was in a lot of these towns. And the town took this building over for non-payment of taxes, as the story goes anyway, and they used it for about two years. After the epidemic was over, the owners came back in here and they tried to fumigate the place to sterilize it. And what they did is they had torches with flame and smoke on it, and they went around and they, they tried to touch everything that they thought may have been contaminated. And you can actually see some of the burn marks up in here. That's where they actually set the building on fire. Unfortunately, it didn't burn down. So it's got a very interesting history. At, uh, at the beginning, this building was owned by Captain Benjamin James, and some people uh, still refer to it as the Captain Benjamin James House. Captain James was not a maritime captain, but a captain of the militia. Um, we have over here on this wall a really cool chart of the coastline of Situate. We have a lot of out-of-state guests that come in here, and they're not obviously familiar with the, uh, the coastline configuration. So we wanted to have this available to them as soon as they walked in the door, so that they would have a sense as to what the coastline of Situate looks like. So we start up here at Cohasset Harbor on the glades and it runs all the way down to the southern part of Hummerock. We also included some of the major shipwrecks that have taken place along the coastline here. The Delaware that was lost in the Portland Gale of 1898. Uh, the Brig Remick came in in 1888. Um, the Nantasket came in at, you know, at Sand Hills in 1909. Uh, the freighter Etrusco came in at the lighthouse in 1956. And the other big shipwreck that we focus on in the museum is the Forest Queen, and that came in between 2nd and 3rd Cliff, right about here in 1853. It also shows the current um, flow of the North River. The North River changed its course in the Great Storm in 1898 that sank the steam of Portland. So that gives people a sense as to what the coastline looks like, and obviously Situate Harbor and Situate Lighthouse and Minot Light up in the northern part of town. Situate has two lighthouses in Situate, uh, Minot Light and Situate Light. And so that's kind of a unique uh, situation. A lot of towns don't have any lighthouses and we have two, and I always like to point that out. This, this uh, mural was done by Stacy Hendrickson, who was an art teacher in the town of Situate, Situate Public Schools. She did that the summer we opened up, so it's really a big help for people who are not familiar with the coastline here. Over here um, is a mo very nice model of the Thomas W. Lawson. Thomas W. Lawson was a well-known Situate resident, very wealthy man uh, at times during his life. Uh, he became a, a millionaire, a multi-millionaire. Um, he built Lawson Tower. He built his estate called Greenwald on Branch Street. And he built up at the Four River Shipyard the seven-masted schooner. It was the only seven-masted schooner ever built. Uh, the only other one that came close to that was a six-masted schooner. 
and unfortunately it sank off the uh, southwest coast of Ireland, or excuse me, off the southwest coast of England um, in 1907, and everybody on board the ship was lost except for two. Let's move on to the next room. We call this the orientation room. It's usually the first room that we bring people that are coming to the museum for the first time. Uh, if we're bringing in school groups, we always try to start them off here, if, if at all possible. Uh, because we want to give them the idea that we are interested in ongoing research. And we make an attempt to change exhibits and to uh, constantly strive to, to find new information about certain wrecks and other issues that uh, affected the social life in situ. And in the orientation room, we focus on the loss of the Forest Queen, which came ashore in 1853 by Ed Third Cliff. So all the exhibits that are in this display case came from that particular wreck. This was a very large ship. It was a full rig ship. And it had come over from uh, China first, and then to England and Ireland picked up a lot of Irish immigrants, and then it was headed for Boston when it was caught in a February uh, nor'easter, came ashore at Third Cliff. Uh, everyone on board the ship was able to get off the boat, swim to shore, and then the locals that were living nearby took them in. So there was no loss of life, so that's good news. Uh, many of the immigrants that were on this ship were from Ireland. There were about 40 of them. And they were mostly kids between the ages of 12 and 16. And they were all listed as servants. And we think that what they were doing was coming over to the United States from Ireland because of the potato famine that was going on in Ireland at that time. So they were on this boat. They land here. They're safe. We don't know what happened to them after they got here. We don't know whether they went back to to Ireland, whether they stayed in this area, and that's one of the things that we're still researching. But it's a it's a great exhibit to show, especially kids that come into these hands in the secular school system, how technology has changed over the years. This is it's called a sounding weight. It has a hole in this end where they would tie a line, and they would have knots on the line every six feet. Drop it overboard, it would hit the bottom, and they could feel it hit the bottom. And then they bring it back up and they count the number of knots. And every six feet would be one fathom. The other interesting thing about it is that it has a scoured out bottom. And what they would do is they would stick in this bottom any kind of grease or fat that they had on board the ship. And when this hit the bottom like that, it would pick up bottom sediment. And sometimes the captain, if he had somewhat of a guess as to where he was located, you could actually tell where they were if they were all bound with fog. This is another interesting item. It's called a deck light. And it's got ribs in the bottom, and it's got a flat top. They would set this down on the deck, flush, flush with the wooden deck. You wouldn't, if my hand was representing the, the wood deck, it would be here. So you wouldn't trip on it. And what it would do, it would allow light to pass through the glass, get, get spread out by these ribs. And so it would go like this. And so you would have a little bit of light below deck. That would work well during the day, but of course not at night. <coughs> this is a hammer, a little carpenter's hammer that was found in the, in the uh, wreck. The handle has been eaten away by worms that live in the water, so it's not in particularly good shape. The other interesting thing about iron and steel is that it does not do well in the ocean. It obviously rusts away, but it also changes chemically. So this iron here would probably not even attract a magnet at this time. It's lost its ability to attract any kind of a magnet. So it's not in particularly good shape. This one is in very good shape. The handle is, uh, the, the steel head, the iron head, is not particularly in good shape. Again, it's lost its magnetism. But 
the handle has not been destroyed by organisms in the ocean because it was all embedded in what's called conglomerate, which is a mix of sand and mud and rock and parts of the ship that protected it. There's no wood really left of the ship itself. Brass and copper do really well in the ocean. This is a little doorknob probably to some kind of a chest and it's made of brass. It's in very good condition. It hasn't been affected by the ocean water at all. But that's because it's brass. This is probably the most important artifact that the divers that work with us here at the museum have found. Um, and that's because this absolutely identified this particular shipwreck. And the reason for that is on this crease right here, going on to the other side, is the captain's name, and this was the tip of his horn that he would yell up to the, to the sailors up in the rigging, do this, do that. So this looks like a piece of junk, and when you show it to kids especially, they look at it first, it's a piece of junk, it's not much good. It was absolutely uh, fantastic that the divers were able to find that. The captain of this boat was all in the Lovett. I've been in touch with the Lovett family. They sent us a picture of the captain. And this is it right here. Only love it. Captain of the Forest Queen. And one last piece of metal that's kind of interesting. The whole bottom of the ship was sheathed in copper. And it's a piece of copper. Uh, the idea was that the copper was slightly toxic to marine life, such as seaweeds and that kind of thing. So it would keep the bottom of the ship from getting all fouled up. So the divers have found a lot of this kind of thing. The divers that work with us here have been phenomenal. Uh, one of the divers' names is Tom Malloy, and then the other two are Debbie Jackson and Hank Lynch. Uh, they have been great about bringing up these artifacts. They have the rights to work this wreck. This is a protected wreck under the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So other divers can get down to this wreck and look, but they cannot touch it. So these divers have special permission to get down to this wreck, retrieve the artifacts, because the state knows it's all being exhibited here. The other thing that we focus on in this room is the loss of the steam of Portland. This was a huge story when this happened. This disaster took place Saturday night after Thanksgiving, 1898. This was a passenger boat that went between Boston, Massachusetts and Portland, Maine. And they had a sister ship in the steamship company called the Bay State. And so the Portland and the Bay State would go like this. If this was the Portland, it would go up to Maine, and then the Bay State would come down to Boston. So it went back and forth like that. The captain of the Portland knew there was going to be a very bad storm the night that he sailed. And one of the big mysteries is why did he sail uh, when he knew that something bad was going to happen? There are a number of different theories. There's no answer yet. Probably never will be. My theory is that he truly felt that he could outrun the storm. So all day long he's checking with the uh, U.S. Weather Bureau. They told him that they were expecting a bad storm. But just before he left, the wind had switched around to the northwest, which is oftentimes an indication that a storm is going to pass out to sea. There's no wind. It was cold. So it was a quiet night. There were 200 people on board the ship. He sailed out of Boston Harbor at 7.30 on Saturday night after Thanksgiving. And almost immediately as he got to the outer part of Boston Harbor, the weather turned bad. The wind started to increase. The waves started to increase. It started to snow. But he kept going because at that time, there was no way he could probably have maneuvered the ship to turn it around. It was a side wheel paddle steamer. So he was committed at that point. At 11 o'clock that night, the lightkeeper at uh, Thatcher's Island Lighthouse saw the ship in trouble. 
and that was the last time anybody saw the ship. The next night, the debris started washing up on Cape Cod, and then they knew the ship was gone. And then some bodies started to wash up as well. All the bodies that had watches on them uh, showed a time of 9.30. So the thinking is it made it through that night and sank the next morning at around 9.30. It's a terrible disaster. A lot of people called it, and still do, the Titanic of New England. If I have a group of third graders in here, and we have lots of them every year from Situa, and I ask them, what can you tell me about the Titanic? They can tell you, they can tell me lots of things. They can tell me why the ship sank, what time it sank, how many people were saved, how many people were lost, and had the names of every single person that was on board the ship, and all kinds of other details that we do not know about the poor one. The only passenger list that was on the ship was on the ship, and nobody had left a, a duplicate on shore. So it's even questionable exactly who was on board the boat. It was a terrible disaster. The location of the wreck was only confirmed about 15 years ago. And this is a side scan image that we have of the bottom on the bottom. It's sitting upright. It's the only side wheel steamer lost off the New England coast. And everybody that was researching this vessel and where it was located knew that if they were ever going to find the Portland, they would have to find this part of the ship. This is called the walking beam engine. And the steam, steam uh, pistons would drive this thing like this. And there were gear mechanisms, and that turned the side wheel paddle. So they knew that they had to find that. And sure enough, when they came across this, this uh, wreck, there is the side, there is the uh, walking beam engine right there. Because the captain sailed, when he knew there was a storm coming, and because it was such a big loss of life, his, he was not around, of course, he drowned, but his family was vilified in the press for years later. They had nothing to do with this decision. It's just a very unfortunate thing. It's a nice photograph of Captain Hollis Blanchett, the captain of the uh, Portland, on our wall here. And we also have two stateroom doors on exhibit from the ship. Just imagine being a passenger on the Portland the night of that storm. You're behind those doors. The ship is pitching and rolling and creaking. And as the night goes on, things are getting worse and worse. And you're trapped there. It's just a terrible, terrible tragedy. One of the worst disasters, maritime speaking, in New England. Probably the worst. We also have, between these two stateroom doors, a life jacket that washed up on Cape Cod on the ship. And on this panel, it's a little bit hard to see, but right here is the name of the boat, Portland. When we ask kids, what's wrong with this life jacket? They pretty quickly get the idea that it's gray in color. Anybody that had that on isn't going to be seen. There's no real straps to keep it on you. But the worst part is it wouldn't have done any good anyway, because they were about 30 miles at sea in 50-foot seas. Nothing would have saved them. Let's head into We are now in what we call the shipwreck room at the museum. And we focus on four very significant events that took place in situ. The first that we focus on is a continuation of the story of the loss of the steam of Portland. Obviously, if you have a terrible storm like that, you're going to have more than one ship lost. And that storm actually was the reason for the sinking of about 400 other vessels. This was a violent storm that affected the coastline from New Jersey all the way up to Nova Scotia. Terrible, terrible storm. One of the worst on record for here. One of the vessels that was lost at Situate was the pilot boat Columbia, which is shown up here above the mantel fireplace. This was called the Pilot Boat Columbia. There were eight pilot boats in Situate Harbor. This was pilot boat number two. 
and it was considered by most people that worked the Boston Harbor front to be the nicest looking of all the pilot boats. The pilot boat had gone out just prior to the storm looking for foreign vessels to guide into Boston Harbor. Somewhere off Mile of Light, when the storm was at its height, the pilot boat dropped anchor to try to avoid coming ashore on the ledges. The chains on the anchor broke, they parted, and the boat landed up on the beach in Sand Hills. And this is a photo of your old image of the ship on its side right after the storm in 1898. I don't know how well you can pick up on your camera, but there are people on the beach right here that are raking up seaweed to gather up for their uh, farms and fertilizer. So it was a terrible storm. The pilot boat Columbia was turned into a little maritime museum, and they actually were on the beach there for quite a few years. They had guest books that people signed. This is one of the guest books. And it's interesting to read the people that went through that little maritime museum. A lot of them were from foreign countries, so it was kind of a big attraction. This is a blown up image of a postcard of the interior of the maritime museum that was formerly the Pilot Boat Columbia. This mantelpiece that's shown in this picture is actually this one here. Somehow, the owner of this building knew that the pilot boat was going to be finally pulled apart, and he salvaged this mantelpiece. So this one is this one. This chair here is actually the same one that's in that picture. Over here uh, is a continuation of the storm called the Great Portland Gale. 1898. This had a tremendous effect on Situa. It changed the course of the North River. Prior to the storm in 1898, Hummerock and Fourth Cliff were connected to the rest of Situa by this beach. There's a dirt road that ran between Third Cliff and Fourth Cliff. This is a huge part of the story of the Portland of 1898. That storm wiped away that beach. In one tide, it was gone, which made the, uh, the North River flow in a different direction. Instead of running down the backside of Hummerock out near Wrexham, it went straight out to sea between Third and Fourth Cliff. If you look on nautical charts today, you'll see that it refers to the North River opening as the New Inlet. Well, it's not so new anymore, but they still call it the New Inlet. This was a picture that was taken about three days after the Great Storm in 1898. Here's Fourth Cliff Hummer Rock. Here's the North River running straight out to sea. This is the spit that we still have today. So, if you live in Hummer Rock, the only way you can get off of Hummer Rock is to go through Marshfield. Or if you live in Situ and you want to go to Hummer Rock, you have to go Marshfield and then go across the bridges to get to Hummerock. All of that because this beach is no longer there. Pretty cool. We have a very nice model of the Portland so the people that are really interested in the structure of the ship can see what it looked like out of water. Uh, it was a shallow draft vessel, didn't take a whole lot of water to float it, which was part of the disadvantage of being in the storm. Just imagine the, these paddles spinning, but the ship going like this, rocking and rolling in that storm. Well, the one paddle would be deep in the water, too deep and getting damaged. The other paddle would be spinning just into air, and then it would reverse like this. Okay. The next the maritime disaster that we focus on in this particular shipwreck room is the uh, collision between the uh, passenger liner Fairfax and the gasoline tanker Pinthus. This is a horrific story. And what I found so interesting about this is that no one in situate knew anything about it, even the old timers. I did talk to one fellow that was in his 80s at the time. I said, what do you remember 
about the Pinthus. He said, nothing. All I remember is something bad happened. And that was it. So I did a lot of research on this, and I ended up writing a book on it because I found it so fascinating. What happened was that there was a, a, a passenger line called Fairfax heading south out of Boston Harbor. And the t gasoline tank of Pinthus was heading up to Portland, Maine from Fall River. And at that time, there was a very important buoy off of the North River that both of these vessels had to find to change course. The Pinthus was looking for this particular buoy because it needed to change course and head more offshore to head up to Portland, Maine. The Fairfax was looking for this buoy to head a little bit more toward the coast to go down through the Cape Cod Canal. Unfortunately, they both met at the buoy at the same moment in June of 1930, and there was terribly thick fog out there, and they collided. That's never a good thing when you have a gasoline tanker colliding with a passenger liner. The gasoline tanker immediately burned, uh, burst into flames, began to sink, and it was hung up on the bow of the passenger liner for about 20 minutes or so before it finally broke free and then sank. Everyone on board the tanker was killed. 25 people or so on the passenger liner, because the passenger liner was also burning, jumped overboard, but now the ocean is actually just a, a, a blazing inferno. The Pinthus burned up there for a week. What was happening, the gasoline was coming up from the tanks on the ship, 100 feet below the surface rising to the surface, and then because the fire was going, it just kept burning and burning and burning, or most of it burned. You can see some of it right in here actually drifting away, and that was heading towards Situate Harbor. And that burned out there for about a week. And all that week, the gasoline was floating closer and closer to the coast. Fortunately, just as the whole thing was kind of ending, the wind changed direction out of the west and northwest and it blew the rest of it out to sea. So the gasoline never did reach the coast, but it came dangerously close. So if you were out there a few days after this terrible disaster, that's what it would have looked like. Now the Boston Globe headline that we have here says, 47 dead, tanker sunk in collision off situate. The actual total number turned out to be not 47, but 51. Just one less than the Henry Doria sinking in 1956. The same divers that work with us uh, on the Forest Queen also work with us uh, on retrieving artifacts from this particular wreck. All these artifacts that you see here, this is kind of a diorama of what it would have looked like the last moments before the collision from the bow of the tanker uh, is in this panel right here. These are the actual binoculars that were found at the bow of the ship by the divers that work with us. This light that's at the very top here is from the tanker. All these artifacts down in here are from the engine room of the tanker. There was a diver that also worked with us at the Maritime Museum. His name was Bill Carter. And he worked with us from the very beginning of opening up this museum. And he had found years ago this steam whistle from the tanker. And he was a very professional diver that knew what he was doing. And as soon as he saw this, he recognized what it was. And if I showed you pictures of this, just as he brought this up, you wouldn't even be able to guess what this actually was. Uh, but he knew right away that it was a steam whistle. This is really considered by divers in New England to be the holy grail of artifacts from a shipwreck. It's a really cool piece. And the day we opened the museum in 1997, we actually fired this off and blew the whistle. Here we have a Fresnel lens. Uh, Fresnel lenses were used in lighthouses. They came in seven different sizes called orders. This is a fourth order, 
First auto lenses are huge. You can walk inside of them. Seventh auto lenses are tiny. They're only like about that big. So as you go up in number, they get out in size. But this is the type of lens that would have been out of mine of light. It was capable of, of focusing a beam of light many, many, many miles away from the lighthouse. Every one of these lenses has a job to do, and all these lenses up top and on the bottom kind of focus the light down to the center, and these center lenses that you see right along the middle here, they call bullseyes, and that's what actually focused the beam of light. Very, very cool um, lenses. They were invented by a Frenchman. His name was Augustin Fresnel. And actually, people still have these lenses on their cars today. Every brake light uh, on the back of a car is technically a Fresnel lens that just made out of plastic. These are made out of glass. The most important shipwreck really in modern times, and the last shipwreck really in situ, was the grounding of freighter Etrusco in 1956. And there's a really interesting image here taken off the bow from the outer jetty. That's why it looks so big. And then the houses look quite tiny over here. It's actually kind of an exaggeration of the size compared to the houses, but not a whole lot. Uh, this panel here may be a little hard to see, but here is the lighthouse right here. Here is the ship. It was 441 feet in length. Parking lot for the lighthouse is right in here. So it was a great place for a shipwreck. If you wanted to have a shipwreck where people could see it, this was the place to have it happen. And that's where it did happen. This one is even tougher to see, I'm sure, but you can see the ship. You can see people walking around it at low tide. And very faintly in this part of the photograph right here, you can see the lighthouse tower. It gives you an idea how far up on the beach the boat was driven during a terrible storm in March 1956. So the, the boat is on the beach. Then the question is, how do you get it off? Well, the company that owned the ship was in Italy. They gave up pretty quickly any idea of trying to get the boat off the beach, even though it wasn't in a terrible condition. Uh, because they were so far away, they just didn't see any way that they could do it other than cutting it up. So they sold the boat for basically 10 cents on the dollar to four investors from the United States. And they decided that if they could somehow pull off the salvage, they could make an awful lot of money because the boat off the beach in working condition would be worth about a million and a half dollars and they bought it for hundred and twenty one thousand dollars so they had some some wiggle room to hire somebody that knew what they were doing to figure a way of pulling it off the beach and that guy was right here his name was Lebius Curtis and he was a salvage expert that was in the Navy, had just retired, and he figured a way of pulling the boat from parallel to the beach to 90 degrees on the beach and then pull it out to sea. And that's what he did on Thanksgiving Day, 1956. There's a shot of the Tresco right here, and the jetty runs along in here. So this is about seven or 800 feet off the coast of the White House, waiting for the tugboat to take it to Boston. We wanted to really try to find somebody that was on board the ship uh, during this terrible event, and we finally succeeded in 2004. And the guy that we were able to contact is this one right here. He was the youngest member of the crew. He was 18 years old at the time. Uh, this is a picture that we had here in the museum anyway. He's being served coffee by Mrs. Lena Russo, whose cottage was right in front of the ship. She was from Italy, just like all the crew were. She could speak Italian. She could also speak English. So she acted as the interpreter. So um, there was a fellow that came into the museum in 2004 and said he knew how to get hold of one of the members of the crew. It was this guy here. 
I emailed him that afternoon. A half an hour later, after I sent that email, he responded back. He was thrilled that we had a museum here, and he was very anxious to tell us everything that took place on board this ship from the time it left Germany and headed for Boston. He sent us a picture of himself right here. Unfortunately, he has passed away. Uh, passed away last summer, but I became very friendly with him. He would send me emails at least once a month, uh, giving me more and more information. Part of his statement that he gave us about what was happening on board the ship is right here. I'll just read a couple of the sentences. We sailed with a Tresco from Emden, Germany, bound to Boston for loading grain cargo. We had to stop at the Azores for disembarking an injured sailor. Before noon, of March 16, 1956, we passed Cape Cod, and in a few hours we should arrive in Boston. During that time, the wind and sea suddenly increased with the storm of snow. We proceed, and this, he, was, he, had, he could speak quite good English, but not perfect. We proceed and arrived in Boston, where we contacted the pilot station. The pilot could not come on board owing to the rough sea, and informed us to proceed to Cape Cod Bay to anchor and wait for the situation to improve. And he goes on to tell us how they tried to do that. Then the captain realized that going down to Cape Cod Bay would be disastrous, so they headed straight out to sea. And that didn't work either. The ship was overpowered by the storm and came ashore, etc. This is my favorite room in the museum, but it's also a tough room to explain. Uh, but I'll do what I can to hopefully make some sense out of it. This is called the life-saving room. And in the life-saving room, we focus really on two organizations. The first is called the Humane Society of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It has nothing to do with animal rescue. It has everything to do with human rescue. They organized in 1785. This was an organization that was formed by very wealthy Boston businessmen. They got together one day and they said, you know, we've got to do something about this terrible loss of life on board ships that come ashore. What was happening, a ship, especially in the wintertime, might make it up onto the beach, like the Forest Queen that we talked about earlier. But then all the people on board the boat, they're wet and they're cold and they get to the shore, there's nobody living around there, and they die of hypothermia. So what they decided to do was to build what they called huts of refuge. And here's a photograph, the last one that still existed. And it's right in here, it's a tiny little photograph. All they, they were very simple buildings. They had blankets on them, they had firewood in the stove. So that you could at least begin to get warmed up. And as the 1800s went on, they began to develop more sophisticated equipment for lifesaving. And by 1900, they had developed what they call the breaches buoy system. Here's an actual shipwreck that was, came in very close to the lighthouse. And you can see what they had done. They had rigged up the breaches buoy, which is this line that goes from the top of the mast here to the shore. And this is what the breaches buoy actually looked like. It was a ring that went up around your waist, and it had kind of pants that you pulled up to kind of stabilize you. All you had to do was get into this, grab onto the ring, and then they would pull you to the shore. So this was actually set up by the Humane Society. Every person on that boat, by the way, was rescued without being harmed in any way. So this whole exhibit here explains that story. Hopefully you can get back here and take a look at this in a little bit more detail. Now over here on the other side of this room, we have the story of the United States Life Saving Service. Remember, the Humane Society started in the late 1700s. The Humane Society in Massachusetts was becoming more and more successful at rescuing people. And there was a big outcry nationwide. Well, how come you can have a private organization in Massachusetts rescuing people, and the rest of the country has nothing. So Congress finally had to act. So in 1870, they formed what was called the United States Life Saving Service. 
And they started doing basically the exact same thing that the Humane Society was doing, except that the life saving service had paid employees and the Humane Society was all volunteer. So it was about a hundred years later that the life saving service came into existence. Eventually, the United States Life Saving Service became the United States Coast Guard. So that is the history of the Coast Guard. U.S. Life Saving Service and then U.S. Coast Guard. The Life Saving Service had a motto. It's on the wall at the top. You have to go out. You don't have to come back. If you were a member of the United States Life Saving Service, you knew up front what you were signing up for. If there was a shipwreck and it was in your district, there was no option but to make every effort possible to go out and make that rescue. You couldn't say, it looks pretty dangerous to me. I'm not going to go out today. Or it's too cold, or too this, or too that. There was no choice. Whether you knew that you were putting your own life in danger was not really of any interest to the United States Life Saving Service. You had to do it. Both the Humane Society and the U.S. Life Saving Service had a basic piece of equipment called the beach car. We have a model of it right here. It's the only model of its kind anywhere in the country that we are aware of. It's made from wood of a shipwreck that came ashore at Situa. It has everything on it that you would need in miniature form, of course, to perform uh, a rescue of a ship by breaches buoy. And by the way, uh, getting back to Etresco, um, and maybe if you can take a shot of the wall over here, of that life ring again, the Etresco grounding in 1956 was the last time the Coast Guard used the breaches buoy for a rescue on the east coast of the United States. Today they don't have that equipment. Not any Coast Guard station has the equipment to set up breaches buoy anymore. They do it by different means. All right, let's go over here. In 1886, the United States Life Saving Service started building uh, a lot of life-saving buildings. And this photograph up in the top left corner is the life-saving building that covered Situate. And it was up on Surfside Road. It is still there, by the way. It's a private residence today. Uh, and these other photos are of various uh, activities that are going on at that particular life-saving station. They would practice the bleachers buoy operation. Uh, they had a setup. This would represent the mast. They had a ladder that went up to it. And they, the surf, they were called surfmen. They had to constantly practice how to set up the bleachers buoy operation so that when, it, when the real event happened, they knew exactly what they were going to do. They would also take the boat out two or three days a week. And in those days, they had to row out to the shipwreck. And that's what they're doing right here. It was a very dangerous job. The other interesting thing, I think, is that the federal government realized that in the summertime, the months of June, July, August, the likelihood of a shipwreck along this part of the coast was almost zero. So what they would do is they would tell the guys that worked for the United States Life Saving Service, you're fired at the end of May. Go do something else for the summer. And then, if you want to come back, will think about it, but you have to pass a physical. So it was not even guaranteed they would have a job from year to year. But still, there were plenty of volunteers that wanted to be lifesavers. Um, I think most people are familiar with Minor White. This is a old painting that we have here, just for demonstration purposes. But you can see uh, how Minor White is set up. The access door right here, there's a ladder that comes down to the surface of the water. You have to climb that ladder and then you get up into the, into the tower. It's kind of cool when you go out there on a boat because right above the door you're going to see AD 1860. That's the date that this building, this tower, light, lighthouse, became operational. It's been out there a very long time. 
it's a really uh, interesting engineering feat because all these granite blocks that are out there that make up the tower were cut on land, they were fitted on land, and then they were taken out by barge to, um, to the site. But this is not the first lighthouse that was out there. The first night light didn't look like that at all. It looked like this and this very nice model here. It was built on iron legs. The idea was that the waves would simply wash through the iron legs. But it had, it had a design problem, and that was that the keeper's section up in the top was top, made it top heavy. It also wasn't high enough. It was only about 74 feet from the, from the ledge up to the top of the tower. The minor light that's out there today is about 120 feet. So, it didn't work out well. The other interesting fact, though, is the federal government got two estimates to build a lighthouse. They had to have a lighthouse out there because this was marking the southern entrance to Boston Harbor. They had to have a lighthouse out there. They had an estimate to build the iron leg light for about $30,000. They had also an estimate to build that kind of a tower for $300,000. So, 30000 compared to 300000 you know how that went? They went for the cheapest option. It only lasted about a year. In April 1851, the head keeper had gone to Boston to buy a new boat, because the boat that hung from the davits here had washed away. So he's in Boston looking for a new lifeboat. And he had left two keepers out there in charge. Both were very young in their early 20s. And he thought by April things would be okay. Well, they weren't. There was a terrible storm that came around the 14th of April. That was on Monday. The storm got worse all that day. The next day it was even worse. And then even worse on Wednesday. And all those three days, the lighthouse was taking a terrible pounding. People that lived up in North Situate at night kind of stood out there on the beach looking to see if they could see the light still burning. And on Wednesday night, they still saw it early, and then it seemed to not be there anymore. Some people even claimed they heard the bell clanging away. That's not really anything we can verify, but anyway. The next morning, they look out and there's no lighthouse, nothing. So they knew what had happened. One of the bodies washed ashore pretty quickly. The other body did not wash. Well, they didn't find it until October. But here's the, the, the spooky part. The light keepers, sometime in the early evening of April 16, wrote a note put it in a bottle, sealed the bottle up, and threw it out the window, hoping that somebody would find it. And a few days later, somebody did find it. And we have a copy of the note right here. You want to come in? Can you get that from where you are? You want? Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, I'll read it. It says, Wednesday night, April 16. The lighthouse won't stand over tonight. She shakes two feet each way now, J.W. and J.A. J.W. was Joseph Wilson, and J.A. was Joseph Anton. Very sad end to the story. So then the federal government realized, well, we messed up. We shouldn't have built a tower out there on iron legs. We've got to build a tower out of a granite block. And so the minor light that you see out there today is under construction right here. You can see how they're bringing out on this barge the individual blocks to build the light. All right, we're in what we call the Irish Mossing Room. And Irish Mossing, the Irish Mossing Room is uh, telling the story and the history of gathering of this particular seaweed in Situa. And Irish Mossing had a tremendous economic effect on the town of Situa, as well as a huge social effect. Today, the uh, Census Bureau says, anyway, that Situate has the highest percentage of Irish living in its town of any community in the country, percentage-wise. 
and it's all because of Irish moss. Now this is how it all worked. In the mid-1840s, an Irishman by the name of Danny Ward came over to the Boston area, probably for the same reason that those Irish immigrants from the Forest Queen came over, because of a potato famine. He brought his family over. He found out that he wasn't going to be able to get any work in the city of Boston. So he built himself a fishing schooner and went fishing. And that worked out pretty well. But one day he sailed down to Situate and he's looking down through the water to the bottom and he sees the same species of seaweed growing here that grew over an island. And he realized that this would have a tremendous effect on his income if he could somehow come down here and harvest it. So that's what he did. He came to Situate, he built himself a little cottage uh, on the beach at Second Cliff, and he started harvesting the Irish moss with a buddy of his. His buddy's name was Miles O'Brien. Miles O'Brien passed away shortly after he came here, but Danny Ward became more and more successful, and within a few years actually built a very large house up on First Cliff, which is still there, by the way. Um, and he lived to be quite elderly, and he was very successful with the harvesting of the seaweed, and other Irish found out that he was doing this here, and they came to Situate. So that by around 17, excuse me, around 1870 or 1880, there were several hundred Irish families that had moved to Situate, all doing one thing, harvesting Irish moss. If you look at the old town reports where they list the residents, you'll see Irish name after Irish name after Irish name, and they all say Mosser, 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 Mosser. They were all doing that one thing. So, what does the stuff look like? It looks like this. Irish moss is a red algae seaweed. It's called, the Latin name is Congress Crispus. Crispus, crispy, it, it's kind of a crispy, when it's dried out, type of seaweed. It does not grow like kelp. Kelp can grow many feet long. This stuff only grows off the rocks about this high. And if you look down at the ocean bottom, especially in the summertime, in the areas where the stuff is growing, it looks like a carpet down there. That's the only species of seaweed you're going to see. So, Danny Ward needed only two things to become a mosser. One was the mossing rake, and we have one of the old time rakes right here. There's the rake head there, and way over on the other side of the room is the other end of the handle. It's about 16 feet long. What you had to do was go out a couple of hours before low tide, and you could rake the moss until about two hours after low tide. So it was about a four hour window of opportunity to harvest the moss. After that, the water got too deep. This is a type of seaweed that will not grow in the intertidal zone between high tide and low tide. It has to always be covered with, with seawater. And it needs a lot of sunlight because it's a green plant, just like the trees that we have. So they had about four hours to, to rake the moss, and then they would have to come in. And they would lay it out on the beach to dry. This photo mural on the wall in the corner here uh, shows the moss on the beach probably sometime in the early 20s. The patch at the very bottom is kind of greenish. That's only been there for maybe a few hours. The whitish one above that is almost ready to put away. It's been probably on the beach for maybe two weeks. <coughs> the patch above that has probably been on the beach three or four days. The one above that maybe a week and so on. And so they let it dry and then they would pack it away and they'd wait for a buyer to come along in the fall and then they would sell the moss to the buyer. Now obviously the question becomes what is the moss used for? Today um, Irish moss is in all these products you see here. Brigham's ice cream. Uh, what's this one? Never heard of this. Wellness salmon with Irish moss dog food. It's in chocolate pudding, Briar's ice cream, carnation breakfast, Flintstones 
It's in Colgate toothpaste. It's in Tom's of Maine toothpaste. And what it does is that it helps keep the food product consistent throughout the whole, the whole package. For example, if it wasn't an ice cream, ice cream would tend to, to settle out so that it would be thicker on the bottom and, and thinner at the top. So it gives it a creamy consistency. Now obviously people are going to be turned off if they're reading the ingredients list and they see seaweed or Irish moss. So what they do is they call it by the Irish name instead, which is carrageenan. It's a natural product and it's in many, many different foods. And over here we have a photograph blown up. This was a tiny little photograph, about three by five, uh, that we had blown up so that it would be, become a photo mural. And it was taken around 1920, maybe between 1910 and 1920, of many of the Irish that were working the Irish moss beds at that time. Fortunately, one of the guys in the picture had enough sense to write down the names of everybody in the picture and put it on the back, and that's what this is right here. I'll just read some of the names. Graham, Quinn, Flaherty, O'Neill, another Graham, another Flynn, Connors, Curran, Welch, Tobin. These are all Irish monsters. All right, we're in the shipbuilding room on the second floor of the Maritime Museum. And this room tells a story of shipbuilding primarily on the North River. There were over a thousand ships built on the North River between the late 1600s and 1872. We also have on this wall over here a very nice chart of the river as it looked in 1870, showing all the shipyards from Hanover all the way down to Marshfield. One of the biggest yards on the river was called the Bridge Yard or Hobart Land Yard. Right here, it was in operation from 1678 1845. That is approximately where Kennedy's Country Gardens is located today. This also shows the very nicely the course of the North River. As it got down close to the ocean, it took that sharp right and went out to sea on the inside of Hummer Rock, way down here by Wrexham. The 1898 storm that sank to Portland broke through this very beach right in here. So today, the North River flows directly out to sea like that. So, this river was a huge economic importance to the whole South Shore. There were lots and lots of people employed as shipwrights, ship carpenters, builders, lumber people, all working for the construction of ships. Probably the two most important vessels built on the river were the uh, Columbia. The Columbia was a full rig ship. It was the first American ship to sail around the world. And it is the ship that discovered the Columbia River on the west coast. And so they named the river after the ship that was built here. Another very well-known ship was the Essex that was stove in by the whales of a whale, um, and it was a horrendous story. So there are some very well-known ships that were built on the river. The last ship built on the North River was the Helen M. Foster. It was launched in 1872. There's a picture of the Helen Foster being launched. They knew that that was the last ship to be built, and that's why so many people attended the launching. The reason that shipbuilding came to an end on the North River it was multiple reasons. One of the factors was that they had pretty much used up all of the lumber within a few miles of the river. It had all been clear cut. The other reason is that the river depth did not allow for huge vessels to be built. 
So they were limited in size to how large of a ship could be built in the river. And the third factor is that the demand for wooden ships was dropping off, uh, and instead people were looking for steel hull vessels. So there were multiple factors. But it all came to our, to our end in 1872. On this wall, we have a very nice mural that was painted by another colleague of mine at Gates Intermediate School, Skip Toomey. And he spent the summer up here painting this mural before we opened. It shows a typical boatyard on the North River of a ship about half completed. And kids in the foreground playing with ship models down here. And as we say to kids today, that's what they were doing 140, 50 years ago. Today, you're talking on cell phones. In those days, they were playing with ship models. We have a number of ship models in this room uh, of various types. It's a fascinating room. And I think the last thing I'm going to talk about are these guys. These are called hanging shoes. And these were put on the feet of horses so that they could go out onto the salt marsh of the North River. And what they were doing, the guys would go out onto the river edge, they would take out sides, they would cut the salt marsh hay, put in the huge piles, and then they would load it onto sleds. And then the horses would pull these sleds back high ground. And the reason that they had to put on these shoes is that it gave the horse foot a bigger area. If the horse did not have this on their feet, they would get stuck in the mud out there and they would lose the horse. This is, this is a very unique item to situate. Obviously other towns are not going to have these because they didn't have the salt marshes. Pretty cool item. We're in the captain's room on the second floor of the museum. And I'll just tell you one quick story in here. We have a portrait of a uh, sea captain on that wall over there. And we have a desk that I be believe belonged to him on this wall here. And the fellow that owned this particular desk was lost at sea. He went out on a voyage, never came back. His wife had also gone on many of the voyages with him, and she knew navigation. And when her husband was lost, she had to find a way to support her family and her children. So she started up a navigation school and taught the local kids basic navigation so that they could go on board a ship and get a pretty good job. Um, and we have a sextant here that would have been used, some, uh, one similar to this anyway, would have been used by her uh, as part of the basic teaching tools. And these were used to locate the angle of the sun um, so that they could find you know, their way along um, using nautical charts. We also have one that is much later, right over in here, that was used during World War II in the Pacific. Uh, naval vessels and other vessels today do not use them. It's all GPS. -ed. A, a closure in the old enclosure where the slipping was, the, the slip, the slipping. Uh, we just wanted to have a place so we could actually display a couple of uh, antique ships that we were, boats that we've got coming in. And also, uh, so we'll have an area where we can put in a fishing boat. I'm not sure what else there is to tell you. Is it a demanding day? All volunteer work. Well, it's all volunteer work, yeah. Um, a lot of us work here on uh, the weekends when the museum is normally open. We do a lot of strange things. I built one of the models upstairs, stuff like that. The objectives we have is to keep it looking as close to the original as we can possibly make. So hence you see the ship lap sidings, the openings that sort of match what you'd see in an old lumber yard house.